This program contains footage of brutality and violence. Pregnant or susceptible viewers are advised to refrain from watching the program. Besogon TV. The heart of the matter. Dear friends, I welcome you to our new edition of Besogon TV, which will be called The Heart of the Matter. I think in the end, you'll understand why it's called that. So, as is tradition, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your attention to our program. It is indeed surprising to us, because the previous edition, together with Russia 1, Russia 24 and YouTube, was watched by more than 16 million people. This is a gigantic audience for a fairly modest program, so I'm truly grateful to those who've joined us in the conversation we've been having, and I really hope you continue to take an interest in what concerns us, because I hope it concerns you, too. Where I wanted to start the conversation, I tried to understand cause and effect relationships. You might have noticed that. I'm interested not just in assessing a fact, in learning it and retelling it or showing it. I wonder why this happens, where this or that event, phenomenon, etc. comes from. Well, you've probably all heard this question. What kind of Nazis are in Ukraine? It's all nonsense, a fabrication. Especially outside the borders of our homeland. And Schwarzenegger and whoever else reproaches us for everything that's going on and everything we talk about. About nascent neo-fascism in the heart of Europe. It's considered untrue, fake, etc. We decided to do a little research on how, where, what and why has it started now. In our previous issues, we talked about the atrocities committed by the Banderites during the Great Patriotic War. I don't want to traumatize you with a detailed story. Just remember. 9th of November, 1943. Polish village of Parosle near Sani. A gang of Ukrainian nationalists pretending to be Soviet partisans deceived the villagers who treated the gang to a meal during the day. In the evening, the bandits surrounded all the houses and murdered the Polish population. A total of 173 people were killed. Only two survived, as they were covered with corpses, and a six-year-old boy who pretended to have been murdered. As you are well aware, at the end of the war, after our victory, for a long time various groups continued to brutalize the territory of Ukraine, and not only in Ukraine. They were chased, but nevertheless, during these years when they were being fought, a lot of people died. You will recall that we talked about it in 1946 on today's Independence Square in Kiev, formerly Kalinin Square, a public execution of the most brutal murders with the blood of thousands of people on their hands was carried out. For the brutal extermination of Soviet civilians and prisoners of war, for the destruction of towns and villages, for the enslavement of the population of the Soviet Ukraine, in accordance with Article 2 of the Criminal Code of the Ukrainian SSR and Articles 296, 297 of the Code of Criminal Procedure of the Ukrainian SSR, the military tribunal has sentenced to death by hanging. Comrade Commandant, carry out the sentence.
Again, this was in 1946. It would seem that the matter is closed. The worst murderers were punished. Some were caught, some were killed, some were serving their sentences, their multi-year sentences. The question naturally arises as to where does it come from, if all this has been uprooted? Where does a new Nazism come from after 40 years with such speed and with such certainty? Glory to Ukraine! Glory to the heroes! Glory! Glory! That is, with all the trappings, with imperial stripes, with torchlight possessions, with bandera salutes, with the official posthumous awarding of the title of Hero of Ukraine to Stepan Bandera. Where did all this come from? We have tried to look into this, and now I will introduce you to a very interesting document. Of course, historians probably know it, but I think that most people, especially the younger generation, have no idea about it. I got my hands on a book by the publicist historian Evgeny Spitsin. It's called Khrushchev's Sleet. It's about the document that was signed on the 17th of September, 1955. 1946 was when the operation against the Bandera bandits was officially completed, and this is 1955. Amnesty decree for the Soviet citizens who collaborated with the occupiers during the Great Patriotic War of 1941 to 1945. This decree was signed by Clement Voroshilov, chairman of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Council, and Nikolai Pegov, secretary of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Council. I think it makes sense to quote a small fragment of this document to make it clear what it's all about. It reads... In view of the termination of the state of war between the Soviet Union and Germany and guided by the principle of humanity, the presidium of the highest state organ of the country considered it possible to apply amnesty to those Soviet citizens who, during the Great Patriotic War, through cowardice or in conscience, became involved in cooperation with the occupiers. In order to enable these citizens to return to an honest working life and to become useful members of socialist society, the Presidium of the Supreme Council of the USSR decides 1. To release from prison and from other penalties the person sentenced to imprisonment for a term of up to and including 10 years for crimes committed during the Great Patriotic War aiding the enemy and other crimes referred to in Articles 58.1, 58.3, 58.4, 58.6, 58.10, 58.12 of the Criminal Code of the RSFSR and the corresponding Articles of the Criminal Codes of the Union Republics. To release from places of detention, regardless of the length of their sentence, persons convicted of service in the German army, police and special German formations. Release from further service those sent into exile for such crimes. While sabotage and attacks against the Red Army by the OUN, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and the UPA, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, continued until the mid-1950s. Source rg.ru How the Soviet Special Services crushed the UUN-URA during 10 years of struggle against the underground OUN-UPA, from 1945 to 1955, 25,000 military men, members of security service, police and frontier guards, were killed and 32,000 members of the Soviet partisans died. This is after the war. So, look, this document was signed in September 1955, at a time when atrocities were essentially still going on. 
Two years have passed since Stalin's death, and all the while there has been a bloody battle for leadership in the country and in the party, naturally. The person closest to the general secretary's chair at the time was Nikita Khrushchev. Now look, the amnesty decree was signed in September 1955. And in February 1956, five months later, the 20th Party Congress takes place, where Nikita Khrushchev debunks Stalin's personality cult, repression, etc. A legendary speech that turned the consciousness of a huge nation upside down. That is to say, in other words, these murderers and criminals for the people became the victims of, of Stalinism and Stalinist repression. Now, the question. After these criminals and murderers were granted amnesty, did they overnight become other as it was said, equal members of society? Here's the document. These are the words of one of the leaders of the OUN, Vasil Zastavny. We quote him from the book Khrushchev's Sleet. The fight with the pistol and the machine gun is over. Another period has arrived. A period of struggle for the youth, a period of ingratiating oneself with the Soviet power in order to reinvent it under the Bolshevik slogans. Our aim is to penetrate into all kinds of posts, to be present as much as possible in the leadership of production, transport, education, in the leadership of the youth, to inculcate all things national in the youth. It is for this reason that a huge influx of natives from the western Ukrainian regions have flooded into the country's leadership. And that is why in 1991, even before Peloveshkaya Pushka, the military committees of Ukraine, began summoning people of draft age and officers who had to sign a document that they were ready, in case of war with Russia, to fight with Russia. Imagine the tasks that the UPA and the OUN, the Banderites, had to perform openly during the Great Patriotic War, began to be carried out in a subtle, careful, discreet way under Bolshevik slogans, which is what Vasily Zastavny wrote about. But this did not seem to be enough for Khrushchev. He needed strong, active protection and support for his power. So he gives Crimea to Ukraine. It might seem that it's irrelevant whether Crimea is here or there, in Ukraine or not. It's like putting a notebook from one pocket to another. There's nothing special. American charities are involved in raising and educating Ukrainian children. Here's a look at where this is going. Glory to heroes, death to Moskvites. Glory to the nation, death to Moskvites, death to the Russians. I'm going to cut the Russians. Seek but in the school library in liberated Volnovka, we found the 11th grade textbooks. In these textbooks, the Russians are recognized as enemies, aggressors and occupiers, and they write about the residents of Donbass as if they are terrorists who act on the orders of Russian handlers. The textbooks teach children about NATO battle lines and tactical charts and how to treat bullet wounds. These manuals are based on various NATO and US manuals. It's bluntly written in the reference list. Look at it. 
And this one is in a grade 10 to 11 textbook. Listen to this. Here is its cover. Here we see a picture of Ukrainian military during the Great Patriotic War. And it also says that they were defending German cities from bombing. Well, I assume that they mean from the bombing of the Soviet Union. Defenders. Let's flick further. Here we see a comparison between Stalin and Hitler. I also found an article where Stalin was an ally of Hitler. How bad he was. But they were good. They fought both with the Germans and against the Soviet Union, specifically the Ukrainians, i.e. the Banderites. And here we see pilots in SS uniforms, in the uniform of German soldiers. All of this goes as we are trading oil, gas, as we are convinced that our relations are truly brotherly and cannot be destroyed. The Americans are investing more than five billion dollars in children's education. They're playing the long game. And they're winning in the long run. It's because of this that entire generations are being raised that have absorbed hatred of all things Russian with their mother's milk. This is exactly what we're seeing today. Of course, we can joke about it, but it's actually very serious. Take a look. As soon as hell is uttered instead of hello somewhere, you know we are expected there. We will begin our great rebirth. And so, when a military coup takes place in Ukraine in 2014, it becomes abundantly clear that the next bloodbath will be in Crimea, with a massive NATO naval base being deployed in Sevastopol. It wasn't just us who realized this. This is how the people of Sevastopol reacted to it. Yankee, go home! Yankee! Go home. For some reason, all eyes are now directed towards America, whereas I think it's more correct to create closer and stronger relations with Russia, because they are historically close to us and we have existed side by side all our lives. Goodbye, go home, America is there, there, that's right, that's right. Our brothers are the Russians. Then, there is the bombing of Donbass, for eight years, you know that. And the government gradually plunges the country into the abyss of nationalist sentiment. Fascists, Poroshenko is a bastard! Get down on your knees, all of you! Beg forgiveness, you bastards! And we keep trying to convince ourselves that everything is fine that they're not going anywhere, that everything will be fine. We distract ourselves with what the Ukrainians were saying in 1991. Remember, since we were in a union, we will remain in a union one way or another. It does not depend on whether we're a separate state or not. Relations with Russia will be at a very good level. It cannot be otherwise. We have to stick together after all. Have you voted yet? Yes. What for? For independence. Do you think there could be any controversial issues? No. You all know the rest. A huge army is gathering on the borders of Donbass with powerful weapons sent from NATO. We learn the exact day, date and place where the invasion will take place. According to our intelligence and the testimony of Ukrainian captives, the offensive operation was to begin on the 8th of March 2022. The facts indicate that a simultaneous invasion of both the territory of Donbass republics and the Russian Federation Crimea was planned. 
And we have no other way out. No. We are aware that there are more than 800,000 citizens of the Russian Federation on the territory of Donbass. We cannot abandon them. We recognize the independence of the LNR and DPR. And according to the signed treaty, we are fulfilling the request of these republics. I keep hearing, why should we have attacked? We should have waited for Ukrainian troops to enter Donbass. Then it would have been their aggression, not ours. Those who say so think how many people in Donbass, civilians, would have died if they had been caught in this bloody carnage on Donbass territory. They ask, why bomb military facilities outside Donbass territory? Look, if this war had been prepared for 30 years, would it have been limited to the territory of Donbass? These sentiments, these people, these descendants of Bandera, would they have calmed down? Would they have disappeared? A few years ago, when we heard that fascism was on the rise in Ukraine, we would have thought it was nonsense, a fake. But it was true. Not only that, it is being declared on state channels, in all the media. Take a look. Ukraine has enacted a law recognizing fighters of the Ukrainian national organization OUNUPA, which is banned in Russia, as participants in military actions. Previously, the list of combat participants included only those UPA fighters who were rehabilitated as victims of political repression. During the war, they allegedly took action against the Nazi invaders. An explanatory note to the law noted that by the end of May 2018, there were roughly 1,200 OUN UPA fighters still alive. The law has been criticized both in Ukraine and abroad. The head of the Ukrainian Jewish Committee, Edward Dolinsky, promised that he would file a lawsuit against Kiev on behalf of the nationalist victims. Thus, according to him, veterans with all the benefits will also become employees of the Ukrainian Auxiliary Police, members of the OUN. They took part part in the murder of 1.5 million Ukrainian Jews. We are called Nazis, fascists, and so on in Russia. I will allow myself to quote the words of Adolf Eichmann, who said that to destroy a nation, it's necessary to kill children first and foremost. I hope that such a nation as the Russians will never exist on this earth. Do you know who Adolf Eichmann is? He's the German SS Obersturmbahnführer, who was directly responsible for solving Jewish issues. He's responsible for over six million tortured Jews. He managed to avoid the Nuremberg trials. He fled to Argentina. He was searched for by the Israeli intelligence service, the Mossad, until 1960. He was found, brought to Israel, and executed by court order. And who is Dr. Mengele? He's the monster who conducted experiments on prisoners, on children, at Auschwitz. These are his followers today. I gave my doctor's instructions. I have always been a humanist and said that as soon as a man is wounded, he is no longer an enemy, but a patient. But now I've given instructions to castrate all men. They are cockroaches, not men. Here is what those who took part in the resurgence of Nazism in Ukraine have to say. This is a military analyst. His name is Ritter Scott. Listen, the Ukrainian army had 260,000 personnel trained and equipped to NATO standards with a robust command system and effectively managed by officers. 
Also worth considering was the support of 200 to 300,000 reservists and support units and services. I think there's only one aspect the Russians are failing in. It's in terms of propaganda. I'm not saying that I would like the Russians to lie, but I would like them to present their point of view in this confrontation. What they're confronting is not just propaganda from the Ukrainian government. You have to consider that the CIA CIA works closely with the Ukrainian Ministry for Information, and the CIA has responsibility for what is called an information operation. Not only are the Americans bringing up the younger generation, they also appoint the leadership of the country. Listen, this is very interesting. This is an infamous conversation that took place in 2014 between Victoria Newland and the American ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt. Newland, what do you think? Pyatt, I think we're in the game. The issue with Klitschko, obviously. Pyatt, it's a tricky link here, particularly the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. Pyatt, have you seen some of my notes on the relationship problems now? Pyatt, so we're trying to find out quickly what his role is. Newland, okay, I don't think Klitschko should be in government, I don't think it's necessary, and I don't think it's a good idea. Pyatt, yes, in terms of him not being in government, let him stay out and do his political work. I just think if it's about moving the process forward, we want to keep moderate Democrats together. Newland, I think Yatsenyuk is the right man for the job. He has experience in economic issues, in governance issues. After U.S. congressman asked the U.S. State Department in 2019 to list the Ukrainian Azov Regiment as a terrorist organization on the grounds that Nazism was being nurtured there, only three years had passed. And now the U.S. Congress and the European Union Parliament are already shouting the Bandera slogan, Glory to Ukraine! at the top of their lungs. We are with you! Glory to Ukraine! Extraordinary meeting of the European Parliament in Brussels on the 1st of the 3rd, 1022. Glory to Ukraine, my colleagues, glory to Ukraine! Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's speech my to the US Congress, 16th of March, 2022. You tell me, is it possible for common racism to flourish in today's Europe after World War II? Look at what this Italian says. Look at what this Italian says. My Russian wife and I have had my account blocked without warning just because my wife is Russian. Open your eyes. Wake up. Don't believe what NATO and Europe say. They keep arming Ukraine and giving it money. 110 million euros. Don't believe the nonsense our media is peddling. This is the sign forbidding Russians to enter in France. And here's more. Russians in Paris and in France have to behave with restraint. A Molotov cocktail has been thrown at a Russian cultural center. Graffiti has appeared on the poster of the Rachmaninoff Conservatory. And owners of Russian restaurants are receiving threats, even if they are not connected to Russia. Nice little restaurant near Stuttgart. It's all good, except that the owner has apparently decided to play Hitler. There is a warning on the restaurant's website. Visitors with Russian passports are not welcome in our restaurant. Going back to the question of the return of the Banderites in 1955, this heredity is not unique to us. Look, the present Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, is the grandson of Lieutenant General and SS Gruppenführer Fritz von Scholz, who fought with the Russians in both world wars and was personally involved in the execution of Jews in Poland and in Ukraine. No wonder Mr. Scholz smiles when he hears the word genocide taking place in the Donbass. He moves on to the argument that something like genocide is taking place in the Donbass, which is really funny. Let's face it. What about the billions stolen from us that are frozen in foreign bank accounts? 
What about the sacred right to property being taken from the citizens of the Russian Federation? What about the non-return of the richest collections that have been sent to various countries for exhibitions under arrangements? Here is a listen to what the Chinese ambassador Zhang Zhao says in Kazakhstan. After this political show of the collective West, which promoted that science without borders, sports beyond politics, private property is invincible, freedom of speech, etc., all these Western values have now lost credibility. The West would do well to moderate its moralizing. I think it's no secret that the senior leadership of the United States, by and large, do not act of their own free will, nor according to their own reasoning. Many scoff at Biden's age. His instant change of heart at the prompting of whoever is around. Ridiculous reservations. Imagine now that Vice President Kamala Harris takes his place for some legal reason. Here's a listen to this monologue. The governor and I were touring the library and talking about the significance of the flow of time. Yes, the significance of the flow of time. If you think about it, there is a huge significance of the flow of time in terms of what we need to do to create jobs. And there is a huge value in the flow of time if you think about one day in the life of our children. For starters, if you need a good reason to pray for the health of our president, you're reminded again today that that reason is for our vice president. You know, a president his age may or may not have cognitive problems, but for her age, she's just dumb. Let's face it, Kamala Harris is apparently the dumbest person ever to be elected vice president in U.S. history. Now, imagine that for some reason Kamala Harris becomes president. Would she, what, make her own decisions or would she be guided too? And yet President Biden in his own name or not says this. Listen to this. You know I think we're at a tipping point in the world economy. Not just in the world economy, in the world. It happens every three or four generations. As one senior military official told me the other day at a security meeting between 1900 and 1946, 60 million people died. Since then, we've established a liberal world order, and there has not been such a loss of life for a long time. A lot of people are dying, but there's nowhere near the chaos. And now is the time when things are changing. A world order will be established. We have to lead it, and for that we must unite the rest of the free world. Doesn't it remind us of anything? For example, the Neuordnung of Europe, that is, the German New Order. That is, it is a new political order to be established by Nazi Germany in the occupied territories. Its creation was initiated long before World War II, but it was announced in 1941 by Adolf Hitler at a speech in Berlin's Palace of Sports. Here is what he said. I am convinced that 1941 will be a historic year for the great restructuring of Europe. I think at that time the Soviet Union was not prepared to resist this new order, and it took a terrible four years of great sacrifice and bloodshed to survive the struggle. Tell me, is the new world order that has been declared today acceptable to us? Can we resist it? Can today's Russia, our today's Russia, withstand this onslaught, this test? Can we retain our independence and sovereignty? I found it very interesting what journalist and political scientist Pyotr Akorov thinks about this. Listen. What was the main vulnerability of the outgoing Russia? 
In its dependence on the outside world, in the mental slavery of quite a few of our elite, their ideological dependence on the West, their mental slavery to an advanced Western civilization was only a consequence of their contempt for their own people, people who can be cheated and robbed, not all elite. There were quite a few honest, national-minded officials and entrepreneurs, and even in the creative community, especially if you wade through the stardust. But they were not the ones who were noticeable, both in our country and in the West. A lot of our elite simply fled the country. Yes, banally they fled, some out of fear, some because of the impossibility to breathe the same air as the cattle. That is, not simply a betrayal of their own people, but what Putin has very rightly called the natural and necessary process of self-purification of our society. Everyone has seen what motherland means to someone in their hour of need. And this was confirmed by the words of our president. Remember, the collective West is trying to divide our society by speculating on war losses, on the socio-economic consequences of sanctions, to provide civil confrontation in Russia and, using its fifth column, seeks to achieve its goal. And the goal is the same, as I've said before, the destruction of Russia. Undoubtedly, they will try to bet on the so-called fifth column, on the national traitors, on those who earn money here, in our country, but live there, and live not even in the geographical sense of the word, but their thoughts by their slavish consciousness. I'm not at all judging those who have a villa in Miami or on the French Riviera, who cannot do without foie gras, oysters, and so-called gender freedoms. But that is absolutely not the problem, and I repeat, the problem is that many of these people are inherently mentally there and not here, not with our people, not with Russia. Then I have a question for those who are left. Why are many of them silent? I don't mean the faint-hearted with a delicate emotional psyche, no. But governors? Why just a handful of them have publicly expressed their attitude to what is happening, their public stance? How important is it to explain to people in the regions what is going on, what the meaning of the policy pursued by the state is? How is it possible that being vested with enormous power, one cannot go and meet people? To plants, factories, design bureaus, hospitals, schools, institutes. How can one not explain to people why they must overcome difficulties? Difficulties that will not only be there today, but for some time tomorrow as well. It seems to me that it's very important for people to understand that today they will be provided with jobs at this time when there are sanctions against us. And import substitution is not a figure of speech. It's a daily, minute-by-minute -minute job. A daily task for millions of our citizens on the ground. And the leadership on the ground must explain. Explain and help people, that is. Work day and night in this direction. I don't want to say that no one is doing anything. God forbid. I don't want to be accused of that. But it just seems to me that some of the euphoria in which we've been living for the last few years has dulled this sense of danger. Remember, at the beginning of the Great Patriotic War, within a few months, gigantic factories were moved from the center of the country to the Urals, and almost immediately, convoys of tanks, cannons and weapons and so on and so forth were sent to the front. But tell me, how can such a mobilization, a necessary mobilization, take place today if, on a federal channel, during a live broadcast, something like this can happen? At a meeting with his Belarusian counterpart, the Russian Prime Minister stressed we need to strengthen cooperation within the framework of the Union State. 
and at a meeting in the government, they discussed how to maintain accessibility. The voice of presenter Katerina Andreeva, picket girl, stop the war, no to war, stop the war, no to war. By the way, I can't help but note the poise and professionalism of the presenter, Katya Andreeva. She didn't even raise an eyebrow. And believe me, this is not a flighty, hysterical loner lady or a CIA agent. <laughs> no. This is systemic corrosion. Well, you know what it's like to be in the studio during a live broadcast from which it is broadcast on a large state channel? This is a military facility. This is a serious matter. In other words, one cannot just walk in from the street. And once there, it's no less difficult to do what Ms. Ovsanikonova did if there were no people around who were helping her, either indirectly or directly, intentionally or by some misunderstanding. This means that there are people who can carry out almost a crime on the air towards the belligerent side. How can people fight if they do not feel, do not believe in their own rear, that there are those behind their backs who understand why they're fighting? Yes, there may be completely different points of view. Some may be for and some against. But on a state channel, during a live broadcast, this cannot and should not be the case. And here's another thing I want to say, maybe the most important thing at the moment. Listen to what the Ukrainian blogger, journalist, political scientist Yuri Podolyaka has to say. So, what is the essence of the problem by the example of Putivil? This town in the Sumi region, I know it like the back of my hand, is the only town in the Putivil district, and the only district where not only is there a Russian-speaking population, but they're also the predominant group. On February the 24th, the Russian army passed this city without firing a single shot in just a few hours, and then the total blackout was established in the city, absolutely without any electrical power. The populous Putivil city residents wrote, Yura, what's happening? What why is this happening? Where is the administration? And it did not show up. Or rather, it did appear. But three weeks later, the Ukrainian military commissar returned to the town and started distributing guns from the local armory that no one had even checked out for ammunition types and gauges. So he started handing out these weapons, creating a territorial defense unit. You must understand that any, even the most effective actions of any army, have to be backed up administratively. In general, in general, power is the thing. It does not tolerate vacuum. If you don't create the tools, the cells of power, then others will create it. Incidentally, the situation gradually began to change and civil military administrations emerged. Journalist Yuri Padolyaka also spoke about them. Yesterday, or the day before yesterday, it was decided that military civil administrations would be introduced in the liberated territories. And today, the first such administration appeared in the town of Semyonovka, Chernihiv region. And according to the information I have, that was only the first swallow, today, tomorrow, or the day after. We will see an avalanche-like process of the creation of such administrations, and in the Sumi region, where the so-called terror defense units are entrenched. You understand, don't you? All these sacrifices, all these efforts that the country is making, they will be absolutely meaningless if the liberated territories do not have the kind of power that will keep these people from the possible return of those who are holding them in basements. Otherwise, a reverse wave, like a bloody tsunami, will sweep away everything and everyone for which this special operation to save people was conceived. But we all know that justice is one of the biggest and most important values for Russians and Ukrainians alike. But it's not fair. If people are finally being let out of basements, now there is only a possibility that they might be driven there at best and, at worst, deprived of their lives? 
But I'm sure that the victory will be ours. Otherwise, we will have to submit to the new world order that is being promised and prepared for us. Therefore, I want to remind all doubters the words of Bismarck. We mention them in one of the programs. I know hundreds of ways to get the Russian bear out of the den, but none to drive it back. Well, we're not the only ones who seem to understand that. Look, once at the General Staff, we were celebrating the victory in the Cold War. And I asked the General, Sir, why don't you drink? He said, we can celebrate and party all we want, but there's a but. We didn't beat the Russians. We fooled them. When they finally realize this, we will regret it. Well, that's all for today, because our midshipman Kivaruchko came and said, as always, we leave one by one. If anything, we are geologists. But no, here's another postscript. That's what I wanted to say. I'm like 30 years old, young enough, right? And foolishly, when I was young, I judged our president in some part. I did not understand. I was judging. Guys, I'm sorry, but looking at what is happening now, I would probably apologize to him. I see that he is for the people. Thanks to him now, despite the fact that in principle it's hard in the country, but do you see how we, yes, have united? No one is giving up. I would probably say to him when we met, Mr. President, I can see it now. I really see. I'm grateful to you. Bow low for the fact that we have the opportunity not only to see the sunsets, yes, but also the sun rises. The opportunity to see the future and the present. Not only in the colors of rosy western sources, but as they should be. Russian, with a smile on your face. For some reason, it's hard in our country today, but we rejoice and it shows. And I rejoice too. I rejoice that I can open my doors and see my children. I'm glad that I'm ready to fight for Russia. I honestly say, five years ago, if someone asked me whether I would go to war, I would always ask, for what? For whom? Now I see for whom, and I will go. Yes, if I have to, I will go with my head held high. I'll go for my people, for all these people you've united. I'll go wherever you tell me to go now. I believe you. There has never been such a unification. Don't let us down, please. We have mad faith in you now, because I care about our country. This is the way it is. Just tell us what needs to be done. We'll do it. Don't let us down, dear. I want a bright future with such a president. Most importantly, don't let us down, dear sir. We appreciate and love you now. Young man's speech. All the best to you. I look forward to seeing you at the next meeting.